Hello. I'd like to welcome you to chemistry. Um, we're going to be together for this year. My name is Michelle Reitler, and um, we're going to start off with an introduction to chemistry and talk about the branches of it and so on. This is lecture part one of three for lecture one, so make sure that you hear all three parts before attempting any quizzes. So let's start right off with what chemistry actually is. Chemistry is the study of matter, its composition, properties, and the changes that matter undergoes. Pure chemistry gathers the knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's the same thing as saying basic research. Applied chemistry is the use of chemistry to attain certain goals in fields like medicine, agriculture, and manufacturing. Pure chemistry usually comes first, and applied usually comes later. Pure chemistry can explain the behavior that has been used without knowing why, and pure chemistry really isn't good or bad. Applied chemistry is often called technology or engineering, and it can be good or bad depending on the use of those applications. So since I said chemistry is the study of matter, let's take a look at what matter actually is. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Mass is the amount of matter in an object and is defined as the resistance to change in motion along a smooth and level surface. That's the physics definition of matter. There are two essential types of, or physics definition of mass, I'm sorry. There are two essential types of matter, substances and mixtures. Substances are often called pure substances and are made up of a particular type of matter. Mixtures contain more than one type of matter. Matter has different properties, physical properties that can be observed and measured without changing a substance, such as its color or mass. Chemical properties are another um, type of property for matter, and it can only be observed by changing the types of substances, such as its electronegativity or its combustibility. There are many types of branches of chemistry. We're going to talk a little bit about each one. Analytical chemistry studies the compositions of substances. Organic chemistry studies compounds containing carbon. Inorganic chemistry studies substances that don't contain carbon. Biochemistry is the study of the chemistry of living things, often combined with organic chemistry, but not always. And physical chemistry studies the behavior of substances such as rates and mechanisms of reactions or energy transformations. Additionally, there's also one that's not on here called analytical chemistry. Analytical chemistry is the study of the composition of something. So they're taking the component parts and they're identifying them. Applied chemistry can function in material science such as in paint, plastics, and nanotechnology industries. Microscopic scale is the stuff that is too small to see with the unaided eye. The macroscopic scale is the stuff that is big enough to see normally. And nanotechnology involves manipulating individual atoms or molecules. There are many, many, many applied chemistry fields. Let's take a look at energy first. Energy is the ability to do work. There are different types of energy, and they can be converted into other types, but they can't be created or destroyed. Energy conservation focus, focuses on more efficient conversion or insulation. Energy production focuses on finding new sources of energy, and energy storage focuses on batteries and fuel cells. And these are all where chemists can be involved. Agricultural research is applied chemistry that focuses either on the production, such as fertilizers or soil tests, or the protection of crops, which would include development of pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Medicine and applied chemistry often works in drug research, materials research, or biotechnology. Materials research can include replacement joints, artificial skin development, or cartilage replacement. Biotechnology is using organisms as a means of production for medicine. Um, things like insulin is produced by bacteria nowadays. Environmental applications of applied chemistry can include eliminating sources of pollution or treating substances to clear pollutants. And astronomy uses applied chemistry to do remote analysis of stars from their light using the 
a process called spectroscopy, or to analyze extraterrestrial samples, such as in moon rocks and meteorites. A good example of this very, very recently is that we have um, determined that there are sugar molecules near a distant star using spectroscopy. And one of the things that that's exciting is that may be an indication that there are living things somewhere in orbit around that star. So um, that just came out last month and it's pretty exciting. Okay, we're gonna start off with the history of chemistry. Chemistry had a long and um, varied past. It started off often with alchemy, but we'll talk about, uh, we'll go even further back to Thales of Miletus. He lived in 600 BC and he was the first natural philosopher to hypothesize the makeup of matter. He said that water was the universal element, and his evidence was that heating substances releases steam, which is water, and when you're hot, you sweat. He also showed that the water cycle shows how water interacts everywhere, and he said that nature follows a pattern of laws. Democritus, who lived in 400 BC, developed the first atomic hypothesis. He said that atomos, which is Greek for uncuttable, um, he said that the properties of atoms are that they are indestructible, but they are changeable, however, into different forms, and they contain an infinite number of kinds of atoms, so there are an infinite number of elements. We know that's not actually true now, but that was his original thought. He also said that hard substances have rough prickly atoms that stick together, that liquids have round smooth atoms that slide over one another, and smell is caused by atoms interacting with the nose, and that rough atoms can hurt the nose, something like ammonia would have rough atoms. Um, he's actually kind of right on that one, not the rough atoms part, but our smell is determined by molecules hitting our nasal receptors. He also thought that sleep is caused by atoms escaping the brain, and death occurs when too many of those atoms escaped or didn't return. He thought that the heart is the center of anger, the brain is the center of thought, he got that one right, and the liver is the seat of desire. That's kind of an interesting one. You know, you can't go to a singles bar and say, hey baby, my liver really likes you. His famous quote is that nothing exists but atoms in space and all else is opinion. I've heard some historians say something very similar. Empedocles, who lived in 400 BC, developed the four elements hypothesis, which were common all the way through the Middle Ages. He said that the primary matter is earth, air, fire, and water. Those are the four elements. The four qualities of those matter uh, uh, elements are wet, dry, warm, and cold, and that the four elements are brought together by love and are separated by hate. His evidence was that burning and producing fire... Um, produces water, gases, and ashes. Um, his sample formula is that human flesh is equal quantities of the four elements, because we are, of course, perfect in Greek eyes, and that bones is half fire, one quarter earth, and one quarter water. So bones have no air in them. And then we go to Aristotle, because he gets his own page. He had several big actions. He established the world's greatest library or university at Alexandria that lasted 700 years. He used diagrams to illustrate points and observations. This was a first. He reviewed and criticized the work of others, leading to peer review, uh, which we still use in research today. He preserved much of the knowledge of the ancient world, established the science of biology. He supported the four elements hypothesis he invented a diving bell and took Alexander the Great on a tour of the harbor bottom. He added the four element hypothesis and proposed a fifth element of the ether or heavenly glow. Ether was still being sought in the 1800s as a medium for transmitting light. He described the heavens as a series of spheres made of crystal. We still use this term in our terms for geosphere, which is the earth as the center of the universe the hydrosphere or waters of the earth, the atmosphere, the air above the earth, the pyrosphere, which is lightning, the stellar sphere, which is all stars, he said were on the same sphere, which wasn't true, and the prime mover or the first cause that keeps all of these spheres in motion. 
Okay, we're going to pick up with Aristotle in part two, and uh, I will see you then.